this week's edition of Scouting in Gray. It's the day after National Signing Day. I'm joined by the old Buckeye Blueprint crew, Nick McWilliams, the sports editor of the Lantern, and Jacob Myers, the assistant sports editor of the Lantern. And so we just saw Ohio State bring in their new class, and we got to talk to eight of the early enrollees. Josh Myers was not there. But this is one of, if not Urban Meyer, the best class that Urban Meyer has ever produced. So when you look at this class, what are, what are your first feelings about this? What is the thing that jumps out of the, off the page? Well, just the sheer talent when you see five five stars, 14 four stars, and even the two three stars. I know, Nick, you're not huge on Elijah Gardner, but what he brings is size, and that's something OSU hasn't really recruited a ton in the wide receiver position. But apparently this is the year. Right, and we'll get to that. Um, but just there's a ton of talent that can come in right away, and when you have 15 players depart early for the NFL like they have the last two years, I mean, I think in a couple years you could look back at this 2017 class similar to the 2013 class with the Joey Boses and Ezekiel Elliott. The one that won the national championship. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right with all that. Uh, Elijah Gardner, I'm, I'm more intrigued on what's going to happen because, you know, mm -hmm. watching him, uh, all the first thing that comes to mind is raw. You know, he's so mm -hmm. fast, really big-bodied guy and everything. He's put on a few pounds, I guess, but that's going to happen, you know, with Mickey Marotti. Uh, he might, you know, develop into something that Quite incredible, but uh, yeah, the wide receiver core, I'm stunned to look through these guys' mm -hmm. sizes and stats and everything. It's the complete opposite of what normally happens. You know, Tyjon Lindsay, when he was actually committed here, he decommitted now, he would have been the one guy who it's like, yeah, that seems mm -hmm. like an Ohio State wide receiver, and then all of a sudden they get guys who are 6'5 all across yeah. the board. The one thing that does jump out to me is that the talent at the top and the middle, yeah. the middle talent would usually be at the top of most teams' uh, recurring class, but for Ohio State, it's right in the middle. I mean, from top to bottom, almost the very bottom, it's top 250 guys in the country, which is incredible to me. But the other thing that jumps out positional-wise is the receivers, because when you, when you go, when Ohio State went into the, this recruiting cycle, I was thinking they're gonna need to get the, the receivers. This is, the, this is the, position, the position that they struggled throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I, that I think that they did as well as they thought that they would have. They have Trayvon Grimes, who is, a superb wide receiver. He is right. going to be great, and they're going to rely on him this year. But beyond that, what do you? How do you think that Ohio State did in the wide receiver department? You know, I went to the Friday Night Lights event over the summer and was just completely blown away by Jalen Harris. He has the mm -hmm. the size, and you know, maybe he does he doesn't have the speed right away, but. I can't count how many balls he just simply ripped away from some of the best corners in the country. He like, five. Right, like Darnay Holmes, who has committed to, I believe, USC. And just looking at him, I was extremely impressed and hoping OSU would get him. And like you said, Trayvon Grimes, he'll be coming back from injury. But, you know, these guys, they'll definitely have to work him in a bit. But the mm -hmm. size is something OSU hasn't had. And, you know, I think that's something that, you definitely can't teach size, yeah. which could give them a leg up and a playing right away. Yeah, the size is, in, is an interesting part, but do you think Ohio State's happy with getting Jalen Harris, Trayvon Grimes, and Elijah, Elijah Gardner? I think so. I think they wanted to get that third receiver, and Elijah Gardner, like you said, Nick, is probably a little bit of a project, but, you know, they're fine with that. Uh, yeah, they definitely didn't have the receiving core to get them over the top last year, mm -hmm. but they have a completely different offense this year. They Maybe do. that benefits them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the wide receiver class that they won with was a little more mature, yes, but they definitely relied on a little bit of youth as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I don't know necessarily if it's like the wide receivers that they had weren't you know, skilled enough. It, it is the size, like we keep talking mm -hmm. about. You know, they couldn't create a lot of separation last year, the guys that they had. Noah Brown against Oklahoma, the four-touchdown game, so great and everything. You watch what he did. He used his body, he shoved it around, and was able to high point the ball, get mm -hmm. past a freshman corner and everything. The other guys really can't do that. Terry McLaurin mm -hmm. and Paris Campbell are big-bodied wide receivers. They really are. However, I just don't think that they have the same dynamic that these incoming guys do. They're 6'5", they're 6'3", you know, big guys, but they're also so incredibly mm -hmm. fast. Not taking away anything from McLaurin and Campbell, but, you know, they might actually be the guys looking from the outside looking in. Last year, the freshmen were uh, DeMario McCall, Austin Mack, and Ben Victor. And when you looked at them in the preseason and in the recruiting rankings, you thought that maybe these guys are going to make a really big impact on the year. And last year, they, they really didn't play that much. And then at the end of the year, we're looking back at it and saying the wide receiver position didn't play all that well. Do you think that these three wide receivers for Ohio State need to have a bigger impact than, than Ben Victor and Austin Mack did in their first year for Ohio State to succeed? Well, I mean, they're going to have to. Yeah. Like, we talked to Brendan but White. When, but didn't we think that that was the case last year and that didn't happen? Yeah, that, that is a fair point. Um, I think this 
now that, you know, with a different offense, they're going to throw the ball more. And even so, without Curtis Samuel, who was your other guy you could hand the ball off to, they don't have that luxury, so maybe they have to put the ball up a little more. Yeah, these guys are going to have to come in right away and be able to contribute. And maybe maybe Austin Mack needed that year of uh, development that we, you mm -hmm. know, we were believed that he didn't need to play right away. But, you know, maybe he has that this year. But, yes, to go to your point, Jalen Harris, Trayvon Grimes, they're probably going to be asked to go in there right away. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I really am interested to see how they're going to play because, I don't know, given the last year and the freshman last year, I'm – Mm -hmm. a little bit more skeptical than it would have been a year ago. Right. Now looking at the other side of the ball, there's the linebackers where they brought in specifically five-star Baron Browning, who I think a lot of people are excited about. They got him out of Texas. And I know that you think that he might be a starter in his very first year. Yeah, you know, I see Baron Browning and I see a guy who's like Raekwon McMillan in the fact that he's just a great linebacker. However, uh, Browning has a ridiculous ability to keep up with wide receivers. He has such great speed and everything. And McMillan had good speed, but that's his biggest downfall right now when he's getting scouted in the NFL draft is he's not a great pass coverage guy. He depends more on stopping the run. Browning can probably drop back into zones or even stay on man on some running backs, I would imagine. Now, even though I'm very much intrigued by Baron Browning, I don't think he's going to be 100% a starter immediately. I think he might take a little time to develop. However, with Dante Booker coming back and from injury for basically all the season, apparently, he's going to probably get uh, most of the nod for the starting position. But I think Browning rotates in with him a lot. And, you know, maybe if Browning shows a lot of what he can do, he might be the go-to guy as the season goes on. Uh, the guy I'm actually more excited about is the only other linebacker they have in the class, Pete Warner. I really think that he could really make an impact on special teams. You know, we saw guys like uh, Craig Feta and Joe Berger really do that, but they were walk-ons who earned their way, and that was where they made their biggest impact. Pete Warner could start there from being a guy who's recruited and everything and really start to try to carve out his niche on defense. I think he could bring an interesting dynamic, too, to the linebacker mm -hmm. court. Is there an under-the-radar player that you're looking at? I mean, I just look at the quarterback class as a whole. I mean, the sure size of them, um, you look, Jeffrey Okuda and Sean Wade were the number one and number two cornerbacks in the class. It really can't get much better for that. And, you know, these guys know that there's a spot open, but talking to them yesterday, they also understand that there's a lot of work to do. College is a lot different than high school. Um, to me, I think Kendall Sheffield, who was at Bama, transferred out, come from Blinn College, I think he's going to play immediately in that first mm -hmm. game. And um, Urban Meyer said yesterday that you know, there isn't enough talk about him because he has a lot of experience in a big-time program like Alabama, and that should benefit Ohio State given that they have to replace their biggest playmakers in the secondary. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at those – when you look at those – important players like Okuda and Wade and Sheffield this isn't this isn't a position where they might be able to sit like Chase Young if he doesn't it, I think most people think he's ready right away he's going to be a first round I pick. think he will be a first round pick eventually but it, but say he comes in and he's a little bit more raw than people think he can sit mm -hmm. these guys on the defensive backfield they can't the Ohio State has lost three three defensive backs for the second year in a row yep. and they're gonna play and I think that they that they have that ability to to play right away yeah, no, I, <clears throat> I completely agree with you that, you know, Denzel Ward and Damon Arnett, very good corners, but they're the guys who's coming, who are coming back who didn't get a ton of playing time. They were on the field a lot, but the plays that were being made were made by Gary on Conley and Marshawn Lattimore and Malik Hooker, of course. Damon Webb's still going to be there. He's going to be your upperclassman guy who's going to be leading that secondary a little bit. Or who knows, maybe they have an underclassman step up a little bit more. But Denzel Ward and Damon Arnett have some incredibly stiff competition behind mm -hmm. them. And while they will probably see the field the most, these freshmen could really kind of push them back in the depth charts as the I season mean, goes on. I think Arnett's going to be left in the dust with yeah. these three coming in. He seems Sheffield. like the odd man out. Right yeah, now. absolutely. And then at the safety position, it really looks like they're going to try to get their next Malik Hooker and Jordan Fuller. But don't overlook Isaiah Pryor. He's six foot, six foot two, played against some big time competition at IMG Academy. This guy was brought in here as an early enrollee to get. Uh, accustomed to the program and be able to play in that first mm -hmm. game. Yeah, you know the thing that really strikes me about Isaiah Pryor is he seems like such a real, he's just a really, really smart guy, it seems. I mean, he said what yesterday that he wanted to be a pathologist and that he was, he decided on Ohio State a lot of, for, uh, oh, pardon me, academics and not just athletics. He, was, that, he is not the only one who said that either. Yeah, I know yeah. Sean Wade spe specifically mentioned the fact that Jeffrey Urban Myers, well. yeah, mm -hmm. Sean Wade mentioned the fact that Urban Myers says that he's going to help him get a job after as one of the main reasons that, that he, that, yeah. that he took 
with a scholarship at Ohio State. We'll see in the long run how much of that's really truthful and everything, but Pryor seemed very, you know, sincere about it. Uh -huh. So it's hard to go a full show without talking about the quarterback position, so we're going to do that. Tate Martell, <laughs> he, he, to me, towed the line right between confident and cocky, and I thought that was fascinating to watch because he, when, when he was asked about 2018, he didn't want to even talk about that, yeah. the battle between Hemborough, Hemborough and, uh, and Haskins. And then he, Emory Jones coming in. Yeah, well. and Emory Jones as well. He wanted to talk about, he wants to play right now. And I thought that was fascinating myself. I mean, why wouldn't he? You, you just from don't hear it, though, right, about, especially about with JT Barrett, who comes back as the incumbent starter. He took Ohio State to the playoff last year. He's going he's going to go down as one of, the, one of the quarterbacks of Ohio State with the most accolades in his time. Yeah, but he, he is a quarterback who probably had the most accolades, the biggest stats overall in – maybe all of like high school history, at yeah. least in the last decade at Bishop Gorman. You don't go to a high school like Bishop Gorman and not expect to compete with the best competition. So, yeah. And you can tell he's been ingrained that in his mind. Absolutely. Like you said, he towed the line between cocky and confident. That's just who he is, and frankly, that's probably the type mm -hmm. of attitude you need in a quarterback mm -hmm. room at Ohio State. Yeah, that's the crazy thing is we've been so used to for the past how many years with JT Barrett just being like, you know, JT Barrett's got a lot of fire in him, and he's, he's got the ability to fire up his team when he has to. But most of the time, when, whenever we're talking to him, it's very, you know, calm, you know, hard you know collected. Hard, yeah, hard yeah. to hear him. <laughs> he, he just seems like he's so collected and everything. He just understands his job. You know, he goes out there and gets, gets the work done and everything. Then you got a guy like Tate Martell coming in and goes, yeah, I'm a freshman. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I want to play. And he said, you know, you're going to be competing for playing time. You're going to be getting in there. And he did not yeah. seem phased at all. No. And he has two guys in front mm -hmm. of him, Joe Burrow and Dwayne Haskins, who have incredible skill mm -hmm. themselves. So... This is going to be really interesting. I can't wait for the yeah. spring game to see how that turns out. You, you only seen Faze once, and that's when we learned what his nickname was. And we found that out about a couple of people. His was, was it Chuck? Chuck. Yes, yeah, Chuck. Quite, quite a nickname, but I think everyone's favorite nickname of the day was J.K. Dobbins. He, he was probably my favorite person to talk to at Media Day yesterday. He will not stop smiling. He, I, think he, there was a, I think he talked for about 10 minutes, and two to three minutes of it, it was about Whataburger. Oh, yeah. But yeah. what's his nickname, Nick? Uh... For, for some reason, well, wait, you go ahead. With All right. I can't, it, I, I'm going to laugh if I try to say it. His nickname is Meatball. Yeah. And Nick, Nick made a great comment. Nick said that if you come in with a nickname, and the nickname of Meatball, you're, you're at least second string. You are no lower on the depth chart, and that I definitely agree with. Well, I mean, come on. Eventually, the announcers, whenever the uh, games are happening, whenever they're it's covering going it, they're going to have to say, well, here's, oh, yeah. here goes Meatball down the side. I really hope that catches on. Yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't expect anything less. Yeah, I'd be really disappointed if it didn't. He said the explanation for it was he's like, maybe it's because I'm a little more stocky, and he said maybe it's a knock on me being kind of short, mm -hmm. which I find interesting that he's apparently been called short when he's listed at a full inch or two taller than Mike Weber, hey, so that's kind of That's an Ohio State back, 5'9", 5'10". Stocky. Two, 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 someone, so, someone asked him about that, that <laughs> and someone asked him about being listed at 200, and he's like, 200? I'm 208. <laughs> yeah, all, all of these players seem so proud when we were talking about them. Because like, you're going to ask them their, list, their heights and weights and everything mm -hmm. when they come in. All of them seem really proud by the fact that they've already put on some pounds yeah, and absolutely. put on some muscle. That's just Mickey Marotti at work, yeah. of course. And before we go, I want to mention one more thing. is that Brendan White, who's currently an athlete, played everywhere in high school, running back, safety, linebacker. He said right now he'd probably call himself a wide receiver, which just goes to the height we were talking about. He's six foot two and... No, I think Buckeye Nation is really, really going to like Brendan White. Mm -hmm. He's out of Olin Tangy Liberty. If you remember the last guy to come out of Powell, uh, that was Josh Perry, who was team captain for two years, uh, academic All-American. Well, that's what Brendan White said his two goals were, is that he wanted to be an all academic All-American 4.0 student and a captain, just like mm -hmm. his dad was here, which I thought was probably my favorite takeaway mm -hmm. from the day. Yeah, and he said that he was so excited whenever Meyer called him into his office and said, you know, I think he would, said it was right after the uh, Noah Brown made his decision to leave, and he called him in and said, hey, you know, might have to have you a wide receiver because I'm a little surprised mm -hmm. by uh, Brown leaving, and he was just so excited about it. So, you know, having that passion in you, that could really – really make him quite a vital wide receiver. It did seem like they were all so excited to be Buckeyes, and they were all really just excited to get going. I thought that was, yeah. really, that, that was pretty fun to see. Yeah, I want to get your two guys' takes on how many first-rounders could come out of this class. It's so early to tell. I, mean, I have no we, idea. You have 12 players of the 21 who are ranked in the top five of their position in the class. Yeah. I, I, that's totally unheard of. I mean, any of them. I mean, Darren Lee was a first-rounder, and, and he, was the, he was the least thought-of person in his class. Mm -hmm. I mean... You could make a case for any of them. Like, I really don't know. This is like an amazing class for them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I agree with that. I, I think I'd rather just see them uh, play on the field a little bit before I make any bold predictions or anything. But right now, every one of these guys has, you know, just worlds of potential. You have a number in your mind, though. I, I have around, like, eight or nine that I circled right now. <laughs> which crazy. I mean, but that's Before not, not all of them are going to be that, yeah. of course. But, j I mean, just looking at the talent, especially at the cornerback mm -hmm. position, how could you not think that? Mm -hmm. All right. This has been a show. Thank you guys for joining us. And we'll be back sometime around spring practice.